you probably you're well aware of, of what they do is there's on another office in uh, Denmark it's in Denmark which are they're focused on on, on off-world projects as well so uh, Anna you want to say hi maybe <laughs> yes hi nice to meet you all I'm willing to see all your projects great I just wanted to let everyone know that we are also live I am um, going to send you the link in the in the chat and please feel free to share with uh, everyone who you think would like to see your work <laughs> or the discussion yeah mainly the discussion uh cool so um you guys are good you want to say hi you want to say something uh shall we get this started you anyone <laughs> I guess I guess we can just get this going, okay? We have um, here also some students from the from the morning group, which is who's getting a review tomorrow. Of Andre, Hesham, Kerman, I don't know who else. And it's nice to see you guys had had taken the time to join us and, and also get the uh, to see the other half of the projects, which are uh, also great and complemented complementing to 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 your projects as well. Um, so to get this started, the way this is going to work is that I'm going to start by by uh, quickly giving a little brief of the of the studio to the, so that the jurors and uh, and uh, you guys and the, the guys are also looking in the live feed kind of uh, level up with the with the things that we're addressing in the studio because as you know we're touching many different subjects here not only moon based projects but also beam and also interoperability and intercoloration. So I will give a little brief on that and also uh, on the common part that we have among all of the projects. And it's something that I'm also going to do tomorrow with the, with the next group. So maybe let's, uh, if, if I may, uh, oh, and I think I can just like start sharing my screen, right? Yes, that would be great. Okay. So let me just do that. Um, just so, so you know, also, may, and we also have um, a couple couple of guys from the Hassel Hassel team joining us uh, this afternoon. They might be just jumping in at any time in the meeting. So if you see them around, don't uh, don't panic. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start my sharing my screen now. Uh, here we are. Uh, can, you guys can see my screen now. Yep. Okay. Uh, perfect. Um, is it is it visible in full mode or, or also or, or not? Yes. Yes. Great. So once again, uh, welcome to the BIM and smart, and smart Construction Studio of the Masters in Advanced Computation for the Architecture and Design, uh, which is one of the masters that we. Uh, called the NIAC in the uh, Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in Barcelona. Um, the difference is that uh, MACAD, as we as, as we like to call it, is an accredited online master, uh, master program that aims to train a new generation of architects, engineers, and designers uh, with the skills that now they, uh, the AEC industry demands. Right. So I think it, it's um, mostly to say that we are our master runs online. And uh, we have students from all, from all over the world and also faculties from all over the world that join us. Uh, so just so you get a quick overview for, for the juries and for those of us also watching of how the MACAD works, uh, the, the master is, is, uh, is divided in three, three modules and one thesis project. If uh, the three modules you can actually take individually uh, if you want, or you can take the whole, uh, the whole thing. Um, the first module is based on uh, is uh, looking into advanced computation for for environmental and structural design. The second module, which is the one that we are into now, is the building information modeling and smart construction module, in which is the BIM and smart construction studio, which is uh, our studio, that the one that we're going to be presenting the work from now. The next module is based on artificial intelligence and intelligence in, in architecture, and actually starts in uh, April. Um, just a little bit about us. Um, I'm uh, the director of the program. 
and I'm also leading the studio. Uh, and I'm happy to have uh, Oana, who's also our program coordinator, uh, as my faculty assistant for the studio. So um, you, 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 Oana, I don't know if you want to say hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to have everyone here. I want to take the chance to also say that Jonathan um, Erwin from Hustle Studio is also with us right now. Uh, oh, really nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, guys from Hustle. Um, it's uh, just uh, to get you a, a little bit up to speed, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a, a quick introduction and, and briefing of the studio, which I just started doing. And then we're going to jump into the projects, okay? Um, and nice to see you here, and I hope that you guys and you will enjoy the afternoon as well. Um, so, um, really quickly, I mean, what is what is um, why are we looking into BIM and smart, uh, and, and what is actually smart construction? So, so I've actually taken the the liberty to borrow this graph that I found from the Genie Belt, which kind of ex explains a little bit about the the paradigm of, of uh, building information modeling and the different levels that uh, it actually uh, tries to tackle. No? It goes from the from the very basic CAD level to 2D, 3D drawings to, to 4D, 5D drawings, which is adding additional dimensions that are not only geometry to something to an, uh, another level, which is actually called the cloud beam model. Um, our studio tries to tackle um, many of these aspects from different from different approaches. Uh, one is from the integrated modeling part, which involves uh, project documentation in plans and schedules and budgets, which is the mo most common aspect of BIM, but also try, uh, looking into um, topics of interoperability, uh, collaborative workflows, uh, which is actually intercollaboration among the many agents of design and cloud-based data, data management, which is actually uh, try to manage uh, geometry as data in order to create interfaces uh, in the cloud, uh, in the web, uh, that, are, that are more accessible. Um, the challenges of the studio, though, the ones that we set out to, to tackle is uh, actually um, questions such as how to design projects so that they are able to adapt to the various changes of the design development process. And um, I think a typical, a very typical graph that is uh, shown the, in relation to this challenge is the McLean curve graph, in which uh, which actually says that an architectural project becomes becomes more difficult uh, to change them uh, to change the more developed it becomes. Now, we also trying to to tackle the challenge of intercollaboration. Um, that means how to collaborate uh, robustly, freely, and in real time with the different edges of the design process. And also uh, issues of uh, interoperability. So how to transfer architectural information along the many softwares and platforms that are out there. Um, we consider those to be key aspects of, uh, of, of the BIM um, paradigm that the, that the BIM paradigm faces nowadays. So those, uh, we, those are the ones that we've been trying, that we are actually tackling within the studio brief. Um, a little bit about the, the timeline or what we actually set out to do from the beginning was to develop projects uh, in a certain context. Um, I start with a, with a, the studio is basically a, a research based studio. So we start, always start with research regarding the context, uh, materials, constraints, and different construction techniques. Then the most of the studio would, would, uh, would have been about uh, the project development, which is always an iterative process and it, in the parallel to the development of the project, uh, we are developing the project documentation. So it's not something that we actually, that we leave for the end, but as um, regarding to what I was speaking before, we do this in parallel in order to, to um, add the level, uh, transfer the level of complexity for, uh, of the project to the early stages of the design. And then end up with representation and also um, a web, uh, if possible, a web interface, which is, part of the cloud, uh, cloud BIM paradigm that we were discussing about. In reality, um, the site placement and the intercollaboration process actually run in parallel with the whole other uh, aspects of the project. And this is something that I will speak, uh, that you'll see a little bit uh, when I speak about this a little bit, uh, a little bit further ahead. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, we set out to, to pick a site for the studio 
and uh, actually we picked the moon as a site. And this may seem a bit, um, at least at the, at the very least, a bit uh, capricious or, or, or not, not, not related to the topic. But in the reality, uh, we, we actually chose to go to the moon because it, it forces us to create bespoke components for non-standard projects. Um, it also provides a unique opportunity for storytelling for our projects and freedom of design and program with, within specific constraints. Uh, we also wanted the students to exercise research abilities and their creativity to challenge uh, uh, different uh, type of problems and come up with a unique, unique aesthetic, uh, aesthetic quality to the project. And of course, this is not perfect. I mean, it, um, all of this, all of this uh, projects that you'll see actually tackle specific aspects of, 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 of world design because it's actually a plausible challenge for the, for the very near future now. And why not? Um, also, it should be fun. Um, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the very words of, J, of uh, JFK, uh, we actually chose to go to the moon because it's hard <laughs> and because it actually will serve us to organize and measure the best of our, energy and of our energies and skills. I think no, no, none better said than that. Um, so initially, we, we actually proposed a site for the projects to be developed in. In this case, was uh, one site that I um, rather randomly picked, which was a Petavius crater. Um, but uh, turning into the students, uh, it turns out that they were that uh, they wouldn't take my my uh, random site placement and actually dug into a lot of research into what what would be the best place um, that the, that the studio would uh, would be located in in the moon. Uh, so the students took this uh, a lot much much more seriously than that I did in the beginning. Uh, for me, it, uh, for us actually, the site was mainly an excuse to develop uh, projects, but actually they went a lot further into 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 considering um, uh, different aspects like uh, slopes, uh, sand radiation, available materials, available water, and a lot of the aspects that this, the projects are actually dealing with. Um, um, afterwards, when you when you see them, so there is, these are just images that I took from our Slack uh, channel, and I threw them in here. But they actually did a quite methodical um, research about the, the the site that they proposed, which is the, Sh the Shackleton crater, uh, which apparently is much more suitable for and, and 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 very much better regarded for for possibly establishing a moon um, in community. So this is just some part of the research that they made in terms of the analysis of the creator. Uh, the, it's, uh, it's, I think, fantastic. Because, uh, this is something that we actually weren't expecting and, and they did in, in just a couple of, in, in less than a week, in order just to, to be able to ask for the, for the context change. And uh, in the end, of course, we couldn't, we, we couldn't never deny this with such a strong, uh, strong arguments that they presented. They even also uh, pr provided a 3D model for the new site. Uh, which was great because we could we, from there we could actually start to pick a, a more accurate location for the projects and um, like you see here which orientation the project should face in the in the crater and, and a lot of these context-based uh, opportunities and, and problem problematics that the uh, age uh, one site or the other would would have no so here is already the, the, the students proposing uh, different locations um, on the rim of the crater, which uh, one of the one of which they picked eventually. This is all. Uh, this work was done um, in common, and I think you'll see that um, this is actually one of the main challenges of the studio: that the working in common among different uh, uh, different stu uh, students from different parts of the world, and actually in different groups of studios, because one of one, uh, some of them were in the morning some of them in the afternoon, but in spite of that, they had to work on the same uh, colony, right? So in the end, we moved to the Shackleton Crater uh, as, our, as our base. And the students were actually given a program to start with. Uh, they, we suggested a couple of programs um, and they divided in groups so that it, it'll be a, that was actually the, the way that we operate here in the, in the MACAD in the studio. Uh, groups were mainly of three people or four uh, one group of four, one group of two, um, and they they picked among some of the some some of the programs that we uh, suggested for them, and some of them actually suggested some really nice programs as well. And you can see that they are somehow also a little bit com complementary. There's uh, very few redundancies. There's just actually one 
a program that repeats itself that's a moon uh, residency, the space residency, but we have one in each of the groups and they're and I think it's, it doesn't hurt to have more more living situation in the moon anyway. Um, now, in order to get the, the studio going, uh, the first chapter, the first um, the, the first uh, challenge that we set out to tackle was to how and how to actually collaborate robustly, freely, and in real time with the different agents of design of the design process. And in this case, the students were the agents of the design process, of course. <laughs> and instead of us. Uh, providing a master plan or a specific uh, specific site for the for each of the projects, we instead gave them rules for sediment for each of the projects, and they would actually have to operate within these rules to find in common uh, uh, a, a configure a uh, final configuration for the projects themselves. You no, know? the projects would uh, they would have to determine a, a radius of operation for the projects and establish a certain number of connections between the projects. Uh, that later would actually manifest in a sort of like a transportation system and uh, without exceeding a maximum distance between the projects uh, uh, so that the colony doesn't just spread uh, too far apart. The only, uh, of course, the only uh, forbidden rule was that actually they, they would, they, there wouldn't be any centralization uh, happening. That means that they wouldn't be able to meet and, and just put the pieces together. They would have to actually work in the basis uh, of inter-collaboration by sharing geometry and finding an, uh, a strategy to share the pro uh, share the projects among themselves so that they can actually continue forward. So uh, it's fantastic to see uh, to see how many attempts they did to make this happen. Initially, they tried to parameterize the projects and put them into Grasshopper. Of course, this was quite centralized, and they would all have to have the same information. So they. Uh, next, they try to figure a way to share this information by, um, and also, um, sorry, incorporating dynamic processes to 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 make fulfill the rules in the site. Um, and actually, the most interest, interesting part, oops, um, sorry for this. The most interesting aspect of this was that they would have to find. Um, There we go. They will also have to find a platform, a base platform for them to collaborate uh, uh, in which, which wouldn't be centralized, where they would actually be able to gather information and transfer the information between each of them separately in each of their countries, in each of their, uh, in each of their own uh, Rhino instances to say. So the first attempt here was, for example, to use a, a Google Sheet to so that uh, you, uh, to read the geometries and the locations from Google Sheets so that each of the uh, groups would coordinate their positions. Um, I don't know what the way this is actually repeating. They also, there was also a lot of um, uh, meeting uh, amongst themselves and trying to figure out which would be the best uh, general disposition and really interrelationship in between the, the projects in terms of program and in terms of the uh, kind of categorizing the programs and and this and that and at the end they came up with a really rather complex um, excel sheet i mean this is just the one bit of the, of the excel sheet where they would have um, defined the the program the connections of the the the, the, the project that they wish to connect with their requirements and eventually what uh, they turn out to speckle uh, as, a, as a main tool and they would actually list their their streams here because um, part of the program, part of the module itself, one of the seminars fo uh, focuses specifically in, in inter-collaboration inter inter and we use Speckle to do this. Um, so we actually, once they started to be introduced to this tool, they, they, were, be, they were able to share geometries amongst themselves quite rather easily and starting with these uh, uh, kind of bubble graphs that uh, represent the area of the projects and each of the locations of the group. And um, so there, then from then forth, they actually would place themselves in the terrain and try to establish connection among the projects. Um, and these connections would, would um, ideally, conceptually, would translate into a transportation network that would connect among the projects themselves and be and connect underground. Um, once the projects were more materialized, they, they also share this in, uh, through Speckle. And uh, this is like the, this is the final configuration of the projects uh, with a with a 
with the so-called uh, transportation network that we define for them very conceptually uh, beneath them. No? So this is a view of the project from beneath with a, with a network, uh, which is rather conceptual, of course, uh, uh, tying all of the projects together. And this is the final configuration where the projects ended up in the end. So here we have the 10 projects of the 10 different groups uh, placed in the context uh, that they have actually uh, decided uh, for uh, intercollaborating, even in spite of them being in different groups in different countries and uh, in different uh, situations. Um, so this is my last slide, and I think I've already taken a lot of my, a lot of the time. Um, and I will now, I think, uh, immediately give food to our first our first group, um, if you don't mind. Um, Anna, unless Anna, Adenit, or you guys uh, have a question regarding this, or can we just move to the first? Um, it's pretty clear to me, David. Thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, so introduction, and let's go to the next one for sure. Great, thanks. Um, so um, our first group is is uh, with, uh, the groups are kind of uh, randomly shuffled. It's where they are not going by by numbers. Um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and uh, good luck. You have 10 to 12 minutes to present. Everyone, can, uh, can you guys hear me and also see this? Great. Hi. Uh, Everyone, my name is Sumer and uh, my partner is Kim. Uh, I'm located in Calgary in, um, in Canada and Kim is located in Paris. Um, for our, uh, our project is uh, the Lunar Fab Lab and Convention Center and uh, uh, we are group nine. So for our methodology, this basically gives you an overview of how we've reached to where we are at, uh, at the end. So we started with uh, the research, the design development, uh, detailed design, collaboration, and then finally, uh, final presentation. For our collaborative computational workflow, uh, within our team, we started with, uh, of course, any means necessary for, for research. Uh, for form finding, we used uh, Rhino and Grasshopper mostly uh, to parametrically control all our iterations. And then we used Revit for all the detailing. And for visualization, we're using Cringmotion, uh, Maya, and Photoshop. Uh, for our collaboration within our team and externally, we also used Speckle in addition to all of these other tools. So we had a stream going on between myself and Kim where instead of sending each other saved models or entire files, we were sharing pieces of models that we would send to each other. And this also contributed to the, uh, to the uh, larger group stream. Um, for a future scenario, we would also see an increased usage of BIM 360 as we get access to it. And we uh, uh, would also provide more web visualization, cloud data services to the client for their visualization. Our main project driver was uh, creating an ecosystem between the moon um, and, and the other space stations, uh, including Titan and Mars. Um, so creating this ecosystem within all of these uh, different uh, stations um, in order to uh, create a material flow. So the moon would be the first step in order to establish this material flow uh, through the establishment of the factory, followed by the business center and then the colony itself. For our site, we picked the Shackleton crater and uh, the main reason for this, uh, as David already mentioned, so I won't repeat too much of it, but uh, there's exposure uh, to solar gain, there's um, uh, decreased communication time with Earth. There's also the presence of ice, um, and there's also uh, the visual connectivity with Earth as well. For our project context, this is basically a model that's coming from our group stream, where we are located at uh, the outer rim next to the solar uh, factory for a synergistic relationship between uh, uh, some of these programs, also with the VR and entertainment center. Um, to have a relationship with the rest of the colony. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the site constraints, there are a lot of stuff we have to consider about, um, but 
mainly there are pressure difference and uh, sun sun like uh, sun is different in, in earth and then micrometeorite gravity temperature radiation stuff there are a lot of stuff uh, we have to think about for the architecture on the moon but also psychological problems and operational um, problem we have to think about um, and next yeah and next and then we had to choose the simple form because the, as you know already there are, there are different uh, gravity difference uh, between on the moon and earth um, so on the moon uh, gravity isn't isn't a big uh, issue just uh, inner pressure air pressure is, is is really high so it can be like a floating balloon so we have to think about that next please so our design strategy was to like mainly focus on the shielding against radiation micrometeorite um, also try to use maximum uh, in situ resources uh, minimum uh, visual connection and then evolutive design with uh, by using uh, panels next please so then we we studied about different form um, in order to have a variation of connectivity. So we decided to use div different size of domes. Next, please. Next, yeah. Um, so our reference was a Mars incubator. Um, uh, they used the panels and high seat project, which is I'm, I'm going working on with their team and East Tech from uh, European Space Agency right now. Um, so our main focus was to use how to use the panels um, to make simply uh, an assembly on, in, in, on site. And aesthetically, probably we can play with different shape or configuration of the panels and also connectivity uh, for the very connectivity, the, the project of Endless House was studied also. Next, please. For the program, we started looking at um, all of the different functions that would be most suited for our design <clears throat> and divided it up into the different phases represented by the different colors that you see on the right. We compared the areas of these programs on Earth versus the moon, and this was part of the research that we did at the beginning. Uh, we then looked at the adjacencies for the programs to understand how they would be laid out and how they would interact with one another. Um, at this point, we were also considering uh, the different mass studies as they would be related to these adjacencies and circulation in order to see uh, the most optimal form finding for our project and also taking cues from our precedents. So to run you through how the program developed, uh, phase one would just be the manufacturing, uh, more the, the public and private access. So the lander uh, would be uh, the private access and the, the building itself in this case would have public access and this evolves as the project evolves. Phase two would be uh, including additional programs to stack on to the manufacturing um, and the factory kind of builds itself. Um, and this would expand the facility because it would also service the growing colony. And then phase three uh, would stack on a business center to include a convention center, space depot, like a home depot for the colony, uh, the specific offices and control centers for the factory and more formal areas for people to conduct all of their uh, business and manufacturing activities. We also mapped out the circulation, both private and public, along with interior circulation within the relationships between the programs. Uh, so the main public access is only through the hallway uh, through which you access all of the other programs and then the loading dock and garage and, uh, and depot is private access for the people who use the building. For the construction so for, materials, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry again. Uh, for sorry. the construction materials, we started off by looking at um, inflatable structures. But as our design developed um, and we did more research, we realized that we could use the regolith uh, available to us on on the moon in, in abundance for for sintering. Uh, we decided to also look at basalt fiber uh, reinforced uh, composite cables for uh, reinforcing our panels, and then also harnessing space junk, which is um, brings us to the next uh, slide where material strategy. So the space junk, you know, why 
why space junk? This is currently a growing issue with currently over 2,000 satellites in space right now. Um, by 2028, there will be over 12,000 satellites, and some of the materials that can be harnessed here are Kevlar, aluminum alloys, multi-layer insulation, fasteners, solar panels, and also electronic parts. So it's a, it's literally a farm waiting to be uh, used, and this is what we chose to experiment with our project. So, um, yeah, so for the material strategy, um, there, are, there were research uh, about uh, different materials to protect uh, more efficiently. So we decided to use the regolith, um, which is uh, efficient, but also polyethylene is, uh, we can use really like less, less uh, quantity, but um, much high protection of the radiation. And our program is not non-residential, it's auto automated factory. So which means we don't have to use like a meter of thickness for the wall. Um, if it's a habitat, it, it should be, but our, our case is not. So like we, we can reduce the panel size. Next, please. Um, so between two uh, regular outside panels, we decide to use a fiber um, composite cables because fiber can successfully used in compression and bending active structure as well as in tension active structure. Basalt based uh, materials are environmentally friendly um, against uh, runar regolith, which is harmful for human. And it may use a 75 kilowatt thermal solar concentrator. And tension test on a 25 micrometer fiber indicated approximate strength of 5,000 kilogram um, centimeter square centimeter which is equal to 70,000 psi next please and also there are next till um uh, fabric uh, fabric for a summer uh, protection reason and kevlar we have a two layer different layers of kevlar and um, because of redundancy of uh, against the micrometeorites next please um Oh, sorry, I, I think I jumped the fast one. Yeah, fast one, uh, we, can you go back please? Yeah, fast one, uh, we bring every uh, panel, free fabric panel from the earth, and we just fabricate uh, regular panels and bazaar cables, cables, next. We can go next, as well. And then, like Sumar Sumar said, we will in phase two and three we will have a capacity to capture space junks, and then we can recycle it and then make a powder, aluminum powder, to make uh, frame panels. Next, please. So this is our dome. Uh, we have a three kind of uh, panels for outside: solar panels, regular uh, triangle panels, and glass panels. Um, and it, those panels are will be connected each other, and then by um, fixed by um, Anchor, anchoring system, it will be explained later. And the inner air pressure is this four, 14, uh, 7 PSI like Earth. Um, if it is too low, like a Skylab or space shuttle, it has, has an advantage of less inner force uh, and it takes less time to depressurize for crews when, you, when they go outside. But it has a high risk of uh, fire because of high, higher oxygen. Let, next, please. Um, so uh, this is uh, four different panels. Um, so for the window panels, um, they have a shutter. Uh, go next, please. So this is a detail of the panels. Um, again, for the window, we have four different panels um, because of redundancy uh, of uh, against uh, micrometeorite. And also every panels have, have a basalt cable that connected uh, every other panels. And for the inside, inside panels, which is on the right side, uh, we use the basalt insulation and MSL uh, from a satellite, uh, which is recycled. Next, please. So this is a robotic system for constructions. Um, it's like uh, we use a little bit of spider crane um, system from the earth, which is really small and perfect for, uh, dis um, for displacement. And then and the end, 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 end side there has a robot arm. And um, there's the other um, robots are used for the construction. Next, please. 
and then we also studied about how like in, for different files um, there there um, the robots uh, crane spiral robots um, capacity of uh, with the, its range. Next, please. So this is a sequence. Um, so this is. Um, I should start from the zero. So this is phase one, then they land, and then uh, robots are moving also automatically, and then they digging the site, and then making a soil for the level leveling the site, and then make a phase one, and then phase two by crane, and they connect by airlocks, and phase three also connected by airlocks, and the last time they connect each other by panels and they took off, take off the airlocks. So um, this is the, um, is for um, um, uh, Thor. So we have a um, um, Uber uh, pad for a um, moon cake because there are moon cakes also on the moon. Uh, an anchor system uh, to which is connected with uh, basalt cables uh, because of the air pressure. And then um, this is the exterior panel constructions and we can see uh, there are a number of panels are used. And yeah, this, next. So for the inside, um, there again, there are fab uh, fabric um, which is uh, Kevlar, so it, Kevlar is going to be, uh, when they uh, position, it's going to be welded each other by heat. So, so that we don't, we don't need um, other systems to pressurize the inside because the Kevlar uh, is going to be stick each other. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, visualization showing the, the outside. So on the left, you can see a satellite being uh, waiting to be loaded into the, the loading area. Um, and then on the right vehicles waiting to get into the, the garage area. Uh, this is a visualization of the building against the backdrop of the rest of the colony with the temple standing tall in the background. And then also close up shot of the, the contrast between the different types of panels that we have. So the solar panels on the top and the regular panels on the bottom. Um, so we, we, this is a, a close up of the, the factory itself and how that sequence works is so the material arrives um, into the, the delivery or the loading area, after which it is sorted. Uh, it's received and sorted. Uh, it gets recycled, so it gets crushed, um, uh, repurposed or cut up, whatever it needs to be done to process it. Um, there's uh, additive manufacturing for, for the different panels, which then gets uh, uh, quality checked. Um, so there's gauging. Uh, then there's assembly and fabrication. Um, and then overhead robots take the panels back to the, fact, uh, the loading area to be dispatched to site, after which um, they, these panels get uh, installed on site. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of the scenarios that would happen or the capabilities of this factory is designed for disassembly. So if a meteor, for example, strikes uh, panels and damages them, uh, embedded IoT sensors signal the factory to create those same panels, um, after which the factory once it uh, uh, creates the panel, it gets dispatched and then again gets replaced on site. Um, this is uh, just the plan view showing uh, some of the, the pressurization zones and also the different areas and the, uh, the floor planning uh, that we have. So it's, there are certain areas such as the loading area and the garage, which is non-air pressurized, um, and then everything else is, is a pressurized area. And then we also have a second floor only for a business center, which is uh, the top right part of the building. And that's where the convention hall is, and also the uh, the showroom area and uh, uh, the meeting rooms. Um, for our exploded axonometric view, you can see how the different panels uh, interact and how they assemble, um, and then also the floor plan at the bottom, how it comes together. Um, within our sections, I, I mostly want to focus on the the bottom right, which is the sh uh, showing the showroom. Um, and then this is the business center where you can see that showroom to the left. Uh, so as you walk through the business center, there's always items on display inside the showroom that you can access and you can go and see if there's something you want to use within your own projects in other parts of the colony. Um, this is a view of the factory uh, sorting center and what it looks like on the inside. Um, and then this is just a quick walk.
um, like we said before, we played, uh, we made a little um, script for the website so that clients and with the Spice Agency probably we can play with different position of the DOMs and like uh, where we can put, uh, where can we uh, like uh, put uh, our models or our size and we can see directly um, how much solar energy we can get uh, by uh, it's, uh, exposing hours. Yeah, and that's it. And <coughs> sorry, thank you for the for the conclusion. Um, you will see that a, a lot of group, other groups has a lot of really nice design. Um, but for us, building on, on the moon isn't easy and is, is, it is possible. So the, our group decided to stay on very realistic view with its constructability and in, with, by using in situ resources. Um, like I uh, like I said, um, I I I'm, I'm also space architect um, since three five years ago. Um, so I, I, my recent project is also connected to the panels. So I think it's, it is con continuing um, for, for a future project or so. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, everyone. Amazing, Kim and, and Sumer. Thanks a lot. I mean, I think there's really no need to, to, to say this because the project actually says that by itself, all, all of the hard uh, work and thought that you put to make this project uh, realistic, keep it on the realistic side, I think it definitely shows. Um, I'll, I'd like to hear from, the, from our jurors to see what they have to say about this. Um, I, I don't know who wants to start. I just wanted to add first that uh, the jurors also received a link to uh, the PDF drawings in the chat. So if you want to have a uh, more in-depth look at the drawings, uh, you can find it in the chat. Uh, who, who wants to start? Uh, Anna, maybe you want to start? Um, okay, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I think you did a pretty, pretty nice investigation and research about the site and about everything on it. And I found really interesting uh, the construction way. So, um, how long do you plan this this building to last on the moon? For the construction? I mean, I mean, is it going to be just temporary for some months or it's- No, uh, it's a permanent. That was our permanent. question, yeah, of the studio. Like we, the very first time we wanted to have a, like temporary, but in the end we decided to, every group has, has a permanent, yeah, habitat. That's great. I find uh, I, the, the construction way, I think it's it's a really good one for permanent buildings. I found it really interesting and thank you so much for your investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Kim and Sumer. Interesting uh, project and definitely a lot of work put into it. So that's nice to see. Uh, I'm the space engineer guy, so I will uh, grill you on uh, on the realistic aspects of your project uh, from a space engineering point of view. Uh, so first of all, the time that you indicate for each phase, uh, how did you come that? How did we calculate, you say? It was cut off. So yeah, how, how did you establish three I years? Mean, it was approximate, approximate calculation, like uh, based on other construction from case like uh, BEEC or um, European Space Agency with the Norman posters. It's just very approximated. And um, what we wanted to do with uh, Revit was, which is architecture programs, we wanted to have a list of each materials. We wanted to calculate uh, how much materials we can get by some by, by given time, but the time we, that we have for this studio was really tight and we are the minimum group between the 10th the group. There are four group, four peoples or three peoples, but we are only two. So we had to jump on the next uh, fast. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's totally fine. You, you are not expected to uh, to come up with, with the uh, exact answers. Yeah, but, uh, uh, as a tip, Look at the the manufacturing processes that you see, that you have selected. How you plan to build these things, and and 
have a feel for how long it takes, let's say, to make a three meter diameter dome. Mm -hmm. And then you factor it to how long time your phase takes. Mm -hmm. Base it on the, the manufacturing processes. And that brings me to my second point. You were talking about laser sintering of regolith for the, the large panels. Um, do you know how fast or slow laser sintering is? It is really slow. Yeah. It is really, really slow. The reason yeah. is yeah. that uh, you, are, you are sintering a tiny spot at a mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So laser sintering is very good for yeah. uh, to make very accurate uh, objects. Uh, high resolution, high accuracy. But if you are doing really big things, you should look into other sintering methods like solar or microwave. Yeah, the another another thing that we um, considered was uh, mixing with uh, reinforced by polyethylene, um, no, sorry, polymer, mixing with the polymers and uh, regulated thin powder, and then polymer can help allows to attach each other like like, like a brick. Um, it, it can probably like increase the speed of power production probably instead of just yeah two. definitely the the metals with the binders are faster. The yeah. only problem is you need to get the binder from somewhere. Uh, yeah. the, the easiest is from Earth, and if you are talking big construction, you need a lot of binder. So. Yeah. Uh, it's a trade-off. Uh, then my next point was about the... Yeah, you have a vacuum gripper at the end of your your manufacturing arm. Yeah, I no, see it's, that it's very... It's the, it's, I, <laughs> we are not engineers, but... Um, 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 actually, in my... It happens in my... Sorry, I probably I will let you to finish your question and then... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, how, how do you, how do you make vacuum works? You mean suction, it's sucking, is mm. it sucking whatever? Yeah, it's sucking the air. Yeah. Okay, the problem <laughs> is you have no air on the moon. Yeah, that's a very good point. How do um, you suck? Yeah, I think the, the idea was that we would have a, a small pump, uh, you know, attached to the crane itself that would allow uh, sort of that circulated uh, Sucking mechanism, and this is also a precedent we took from uh, one of one of one of our precedent projects. Actually, is where uh, the idea is to to hold it, you know, with the same gripper and weld it with the same mechanism at the same time. Or I'd right. say it, it, it's a very good idea to have a gripper where you have several functions at the end. But uh, yeah, find another way for. Uh, do you, do you have uh, some tips for that? Because like gripping, gripping with the arm, like finger is really <laughs> instable, right? It's, it's, it can be fall, fall, falling down. So that's why we came up with the suction, but I totally agree with what you're saying. So if you have some tips for other methods to grip correctly. Yeah, now we, we, we have been looking at uh, at biomimetic solutions like the gecko, for example, the the gecko skin uh, with with tiny tiny hair. Uh, you use the what we call the van der Waals forces. So you could look into things like that. that would also and then my that... last point was about the space junk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. My my last point was about the space junk. I think it's a brilliant idea to use space debris for uh, getting um, construction material. Uh, the problem is that if you show your slide on the, the satellite with all the different materials, uh, you have of materials, for example, if you take a solar array, you have silicon panels, you have the aluminum um, uh, electrical uh, con conductors, and you have things like tiny gold uh, containing elements, etc. So material separation is really, really hard on a, on a satellite, and you will spend probably more time and effort separating the materials uh, than constructing. Uh, so either you look into solutions like you crush everything and you see what you can do with the mix, uh, or 
some people are looking at uh, what we call launcher upper stages. So it's the, the, top, the, the top part of a rocket, uh, which ends up for many rockets in, 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 in orbit. And they are made mostly of aluminum. So you don't have a lot of different materials uh, contrary to a satellite. So. Space junks, yes, you need to select which ones are easy to, to, to where it's easy to retrieve the material. So that was my last point, but very good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, uh, Benit. I think uh, with this group, you can uh, you can afford to kind of grill them because they really kind of dare actually try to expose themselves in a way, in, in a very realistic uh, way. Maybe most, of, uh, as uh, Kim was himself was saying, maybe most of the projects are not so much focusing on the on the detailed part of engineering and 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 and, and uh, space and lunar materials, but more on the other aspects as well. But I think uh, it's uh, super useful. Um, Jonathan, do you want to also comment? Yeah, I'm just going to commend you guys. There's lots of and plenty of work. Uh, I've been there before, five years ago at EAC. <laughs> I know exactly the pain you guys go through and it's a commendable amount of work. So um, just mirroring some of um, Benny's points. I think what's great is that uh, design for disassembly component that you guys have created, which is about using a modular panel to be recreated and repurposed later on if the structure needs to change. That's something we're currently exploring as well. Um, and the fact that there's multiple typologies within that same panel. So whether it's a window, a solar cell, interior or protection. Um, so that was uh, one point I wanted to point out that you guys did very well. The other one around protection for radiation is, um, I know that this is not a habitable structure and maybe the people occupying the space might not use the space uh, completely all the time. So you might have, you might need less protection, but um, I'm wondering if you had any research based on the ionizing effects of radiation on your equipment. So during fabrication processes, whether that will affect uh, lifespans of your equipment underneath. Um, but that might be beyond your scope. <laughs> Probably. You, you guys thought about that, Kim and Sume? Or... Um, I mean, the thought definitely crossed our minds and, you know, the idea or the assumption that we made at that point was using the regular panels on the outside uh, would provide adequate protection where most of this equipment is, you know, is made using um, materials which is meant to be in space for a long time. So, you know, with those, with those assumptions, we proceeded with the, with the project. So, um, yes, I mean, I, I think next within next steps, that would be definitely research that we would pursue, uh, you know, and put some numbers to it. Yeah, so, thanks. But sorry, uh, that's it's just uh, yeah, good work overall and great job, guys. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Um, and one thing that I probably should clarify is that you will definitely find some some open ends in the projects that are probably interesting aspects that they could they could have easily pursued but in the of course in the interest of of keeping within the scope of the studio we have to in some of them uh make make some assumptions in some in some parts and all, some of them just leave them behind and focus on getting the projects through all the way to the end no because we're talking about the 10 uh 10 week uh program and uh, yeah i think you guys probably will agree with me that the amount of work uh, for this group and also for the other groups that they have produced for, for 10 weeks. It's uh, quite impressive. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Kimer and, uh, Kim and Sumer, great job. Um, um, I also wanted to add, just in case the question will come up again uh, with the other projects, um, that probably wasn't so clear in the in, uh, intro presentation, but the, the brief was to develop a colony for uh, 100 inhabitants um, initially, but a permanent colony, not the temporary shelters. Mm, that's true. That's true. Something probably I should mention tomorrow. I failed to mention today, but thanks for the clarification, Anna. Uh, great. Um, thank you, guys. Um, can uh, you guys let the screen for the next group? Thank you. Thank you. Just Great.
great. So now um, our next project and program it, uh, deals with the entertainment center of the colony. And this is Shelly, Jaime, and Barbara. So take it away, guys. Hey, hello, everyone. We are group 10. And I'm Shelly. My teammates, as David said, are Jaime and Barbara. And we did the Entertainment Virtual Reality Center for the Moon Colony. Uh, when we first started studying the program and the virtual reality needs for the space, we came across Rafik Anadol's work. And he says that VR is about transforming architectural spaces into canvas. <clears throat> Excuse me and into living experiences. So that's what we tried to do here. And this image shows our arena space with Anadol's work projected onto the walls. Uh, this is just a table of contents. So we're gonna go through the initial research, master plan, design strategy, computational workflow, program and form, and finally the construction process. Um, in our initial research, um, we found that the major constraints were that it would be difficult to construct without the use of machines. And we had to contend with the extreme environment as well as the isolation from earth and the different lifestyle that would result from that. Uh, in our material research, we found multiple options in heat resistant alloys. However, the issues were that it would be too expensive to transport from earth and it would be difficult to construct by machine. So we chose the more economical and sustainable regolith, and it can be easily printed by machine. The only negative aspect we found was that it doesn't perform well in tension. So that's the reason we chose to go with a compression only structural system, uh, which we'll discuss shortly. Uh, the regolith is put through a process called sintering, whereby the substance is heated until it becomes pliable or buildable without actually melting it. And we decided to combine the 3D printed structures with pneumatic structures that could also be used as temporary formwork, similar to the beanie shell. Uh, we compared the earth versus space loads and found the main difference to be the static loads in space, namely the pressurization and the artificial gravity. And the reason we chose compression only bolts is because again, they could be constructed using 3D printing local materials. And in addition, we could use minimal form work and it wouldn't require any tensile reinforcement. Uh, we studied compression only shells focusing specifically on the Catalan vaults. And eventually we decided on a compression only vault which uses a single layer of interlocking tiles. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pneumatic structures would be used as temporary formwork, like in the beanie shell, we used Kevlar for the uh, inflatable structures, which is a high strength synthetic fiber. Uh, we looked at precedent and found several relevant projects, such as Foster and Partners Drone Port, which is a vault system that can be constructed by machine in remote areas that lack infrastructure. And additionally, we looked at Foster's layering technique and their lunar habitation project, as well as a uh, third project, which uses interlocking tiles. I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce that. <laughs> so it's not gonna go well. This is a, an aerial view of our final project. And this is our master plan showing our location between the lunar factory and the residential sector. And we felt that being next to the residential factor would be beneficial since that would be our, our primary market for the most part. Uh, this is a 3D view of the entire colony. The design strategy was to create a pressurized sealed up environment and provide protection from the elements. Um, the tunnels at the bottom left there were our solution to connect to the other sectors of the colony. And finally, we considered uh, or we decided to use a closed dark environment so that you would get the full effect of the virtual reality experience. Uh, and this is just showing that we created three separate vaults to house the different areas. And we felt that since we weren't entirely sure about our location initially, that the three vaults would allow us to adapt to changes in elevation at different sites.
So our computational workflow started with defining the program. And then for the three different parts of a project, we designed a vote, a compress only vote. And we went to three separate simultaneously design works after that. The first creating the station and the tunnels and its foundation. The second one creating the inflatable formwork and the inner divisions with the inflatable walls. And the last one and the most difficult one, defining the tile and the assembly mechanism and creating after that the tessellation system. All that put together is our 3D shape, which we transferred this data to Revit to add some walls, doors, equipments, and furniture, and also to generate and detail our views. And this is the process we followed to learn and to define how to develop our design. We explored which was the best two, the RhinoVault or Kangaroo, and also what was the best approach for our design. For instance, having a more organic and single space or defining separate structures for each program need. We decided in the end to use RhinoVault tool. Uh, which is a Rhino plugin for calculate and generate compression only votes, starting from just the boundary lines and some meshes. Uh, we thought about what would be entertainment for 100 people on the moon, what would be feasible and what would make a difference in their lives. And we decided to create spaces for these VR experiences, which could, which could require minimum fixed furniture taken from earth and could also be kept updated with minimum effort so we chose to have a vr arena for concerts and art installations a vr restaurant a vr escape room for interactive projections a vr roller coaster and a bouncy room with interactive uh, 360 mapping projections also we dedicated one whole vault to a more introspective experience connecting with Earth through individual and two people VR pods that are disposed besides this interactive Earth hologram. Uh, our program then is divided into the six major programs. Uh, the arena, the escape room, trampoline, VR pods, roller coaster and the restaurant. They are organized in three separate structures for optimizing the air supply. Uh, for example, one of, one of these could be deflated while the two others could be inflated and so on. Uh, all three are on top of the ground, connected by the station and the tunnels that are underground. Each one of the structures is accommodated under a compression-only vault. So uh, this is the bottom floor of our station where the villagers would arrive from. Upstairs to the main station floor, you find the toilets, more technical rooms, the sealed doors and tunnels that lead to each one of the three vaults. On the ground, top of the screen, we have this open big space that is the arena. On the bottom right, the VR pods, and the bottom left, the mixed use vault divided by inflatable walls. Uh, these sections in the slide show a little bit better the flow from the station to through the tunnels into one of the vaults. These are the structures we have in our project and we're going to explain into more details in the sequence, the tessellation and the inflatable, the last two ones. Thank you, Barbara. So here you can see the construction process that we would follow to build our entertainment center with the inflatable bolts and then the 3D panels. Uh, and it consists on excavating the terrain while 3D printing the retaining walls, then inflating the underground station. After we would 3D print the bolts foundation and build the floor on the top of it. Finally, we would inflate the inner layer of the bolts and then 3D print and assembly the interlocking panels of the bolts. 
As we said, the main material that we are using is a synthetic regolith for the 3D printed interlocking panels. We would also use it for in situ 3D printing the foundation and the retaining walls of the station. And beneath the regolith panels, we would have a double layer of Kevlar 29 inflatable structure, which we will uh, use it also in the mixed uses vault for the inflatable divisions as well as for the underground station. Here you can see more in detail what we have been talking about with the inflatable inner divisions in the mixed use vault and the underground station. Thanks to the use of the tiles, we wouldn't need so much human supervision. The tiles would be 3D printed aside by some fixed robots and then uh, assembly them by some moving ones. So we wouldn't need big cranes to 3D print such a big structure. Also because we were using robots, we thought uh, that it would be convenient not to use mortar. So we had to think about an interlocking system between the tiles and we came to the conclusion that this one uh, was the best one. With this type of tile, we would have the interlocking puzzle that we wanted, but there wouldn't be any thin or fragile parts. Also, we have a, a two-in-one interlocking and layering system, and this one is a smooth shape, which is better for 3D printing. The tiling process was a bit handy for us. With the closed bolts, it was easier, but to tile the VR bolt was a bit more difficult. After we got the compression only mesh from Rhino Bolt, we had to quad remesh it to smoothen it. Then, considering the singularities that we got uh, and the openings, we split the bolt and loft the coarse lines to have four divided. Uh, and untrimmed surfaces, which we could then subdivide and apply the tiles on it as we wanted. So this is a quick view of how they could be assembled. And to help us to build the bolts and to seal the space up, we would have an inner inflatable structure with two layers of Kevlar 29 and air in between the for isolation. As we said, we would also have some inflatable inner divisions in the mixed uses bolt, which could change its size to adjust them to the programmatic needs based on the predefined shape that we design, designed for the inflatable. So for example, during the day, we would have this scenario, which would be different to the one uh, during the night with a bigger restaurant, for example, or to the one when parties are happening. And this is how our whole entertainment center would look like from the outside with the three separated boats and the underground station. And here you can travel around our building. Thank you so much. Right on time. Thanks, guys. Um, fantastic, fantastic effort on, on, on this project. Thanks a lot, Jaime, Barbara, and Shelley. Um, who wants to give it a go from the juries um, in this occasion? Maybe we start maybe more from the from the design side this time. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, sure. Congrats on the work again, guys. Um, yeah, it's interesting to hope that the program you've uh, Proposed, and I think it's much needed when <laughs> psychological reasons, when you're especially you're up there and you're you can't have that connection to the earth or anything fun to do. Um, the programs that you've ex uh, sort of proposed, especially when the different staging of the the times is quite good as well. So it's adaptable according to uh, maybe if there's a bigger colony there or if there's a reduction in uh, age groups or the demographic starts to change, then people might want different things and the different internal inflatables will accommodate for that. So uh, that's a good spot. Um, I think just throwing ideas in front, maybe this sort of uh, spaces can be used to build other 
uh, structures or infrastructure around the, your space. Um, because one of the things will be like teleoperation around how you build the other structures is going to be quite difficult if everything is going to be uh, built from earth. So if you had maybe the space first, it could actually be used as like a logistics and operations hub before everything else gets built. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, it for me. Everything else makes sense. And it, it seems to be a common thread where the tiles and the interlocking panels and the 3D printing and inflatables are kind of the common thread. So it's it's quite good. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, shall I go next, uh, Levi? Uh, yeah, very good, uh, very good work. And uh, yeah, by, by all means, uh, also for the pre previous group, do not take my comments as a uh, as a criticism, uh, it's understood that you had limited time to do it. And to be honest with you, even us at the agency, we haven't had a, we don't have a clue of how we are gonna build things on the moon. So, uh, so yeah, very good work. I, I very like I very much like the the simple approach that you took in the beginning to uh, set the boundaries and the the requirements. So you need to construct in a simple way with as, may, as little uh, machines as possible, uh, avoid cranes and things like that. So, so I think it's very positive to start thinking in that way. Um, yeah, to start with the negative, the tunnel for the communication, it's, uh, it's good and it's uh, very good for radiation protection, but excavating tunnels on the moon is really, really hard. So uh, we, we have this debate on how do we protect the crew from radiation? Do we put them on the ground or do we build protective sheds on the surface? So um, there are basically two starts of solutions for that. The first one is to use the tunnels which already exist, what we call the lava tubes. Uh, these are tubes dug by previous eruptions uh, which are underground and you can use them for free, they are there. Uh, so you might think about locating those and locating your habitat there. The second option is to build tunnels on the surface. So you, you 3D print bolts, for example, and use that as a tunnels for circulation. But excavation should really, excavation of tunnels should really be the last resort because uh, when you dig a few, get really, really hard. And you don't have the help of gravity to help your, your diggers. Yeah. So that's about the tunnels. Uh, yeah, the interlocking tiles is very good to avoid mortar. Um, and generally speaking, if you can think about solutions to which minimize power as much as possible. Uh, power on the moon is a luxury, so uh, anything you can think of, use LEDs, uh, whatever, to, to make power consumption as low as possible. So it's a, it's a general comment. And about the content on the entertainment, we, we run a, a competition uh, open to the public a couple of years ago on what people would like to, to print if they had a 3D printer on the moon. And uh, most of the answers were about printing little trees, uh, little pictures of forests, so things that uh, remind them of uh, nature on Earth. So it seems to be something very important in the perspective of being uh, living on the moon. So entertainment around, I don't know, virtual walks in the forest, uh, things like that, which connects people to the Earth's nature is, is, is something very much uh, appreciated, I think. So these were my comments and, and congratulations again for the Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Advenit. I have the feeling that we would have we would have benefited a lot from bringing you in the midterm, so a little bit earlier to to figure a lot of the, the discuss these kind of things that we assumed. Uh, but thanks a lot because it, it's some of these things that we have actually uh, been uh, wondering and pondering about without uh, actual, actual verification until now. 
Um, Anna, you want to add up to that also? Uh -huh. um, I would like to thank all the work. It's a really nice work. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I would like to point out the, the idea of inflatable structures. I think it's a really interesting and really nice way to optimize all the space inside this shell. And I really liked the, the, the possibilities it offers. So you can make bigger the one that you need in that special moment. Um, when you talked about the connection to Earth, the VR with the Earth, and this connection with all, all the nature, I really liked all that, that area because when talking about a community on, on the moon, it's an aspect that we, we forget. And when we go there, we will miss a lot. We must keep, we were born here and I feel we must keep ourselves linked to what, we're, what we've been always used to. So you've got a really good point in there. And going back to the, to the inflatable structures, I think it is a really nice way to keep growing that community and that network of habitats. Because as long as you've got these, the first inflatable one, you can keep with the shell and, and keep constructing as, as you need. So congratulations for the work. The only thing I would like to investigate a little bit more is the energy you need to to inflate all that structures. But as Advenit said, the sources of energy are, are really important there. So really good work and thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for touching these subjects because they were also uh, I mean, among the subjects that came up that we never really considered. So uh, actually, we, we uh, uh, there was a great lot of, of uh, topics that came up with it. We didn't really consider when we set out for this for this agenda, uh, like uh, the permanency of the of the structures, um, whether are you know the adaptation process that humans would have to go through, of, of course, and and how much would they have to feel at home at the first, and how much would they actually have to slowly probably be adapting to the new situation if they would if we would be setting up for permanently colonizing the moon and i think those are also a very interesting uh, social and philosophical uh, topics that uh, arose a lot of interesting discussions within the studio that were in a way in a way tangential to the to the to the to the scope but but uh, indeed super interesting to to discuss that too uh, so thanks um so i I propose that um, we skip our break. I don't know if you guys, if you guys in the jury are are okay with that, so that we can kind of catch up with the time that we've lost. Uh, are you fine with that, or you guys need to to take off for a second? If if you don't mind, we can just go ahead and and go with the with the next group. Um, Nawaban. Yeah. Let's, yeah uh, sure. Let's see you. I think Nawaban Alexander. All right. No. And on you. Uh, can you see my screen? Can, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. Perfect. Um, we are a group of three, the project called LEAF. Uh, I am here with Alexander from Hong Kong, Dong Yap Lee from uh, South Korea, and me from Thailand. So in this semester, our group has a chance to create a farming project on the moon colony. Oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, the project is called LEAF that the aim of the is for preparing sustainable farming and food production on the moon. So today presentation, we are going to talk about our workflows and processes of using digital tools to help us achieve our goal. So uh, let's start. First, we would like to begin with a concept proposal. The project aim to, as I say, contribute the food production for 100 astronauts within the enclosed ecosystem environment that the most of the energy can be recycling. In order to provide 100 astronauts per day that equal the production of what uh, 10,000 cabbages uh, that we have to produce daily. 
So we start looking at the uh, other program types that contain not only like a high calories, but also can facilitate our ecosystem. And we come up with this program, including vegetable, fungi, storage, uh, cellular agriculture, uh, insect, fish, and, and uh, support uh, programs that we can subdivide it into the smaller room area division. And I will let Alex explain about this uh, program arrangement. So we, we followed the whole colony and landed in a Shackleton uh, crater. And because uh, we think there, we will find uh, one of the most important resource for us, which is water. And in the negotiation with our group, we choose to have direct connection with the res residents, the botanic gardens and the research center, because we think they will provide us with the um, most important nutrients and raw material for our our farm and uh, we go into the our site and we find out that actually it's a very steep terrain across a uh, 80 meter diameter. We have a 40 meter drop um, across the diameter. And our first um, attempt is to put our program uh, on our site boundary and pack them into the site boundary and place them on the terrain. And we decided to go with a, a modular approach, a hexagonal modules, and selected those uh, program that um, does not need that much sunlight or direct access to the outside world and put them underground. And we go back and uh, subdivide our modules according to our program. And we come up with um, uh, our initial uh, organization and start thinking about how we can connect to the other part of the colonies and uh, among the modules itself. But uh, before we go into the project documentation, I will pass it on to Dongyap to talk about the construction proposal. Let me explain how our construction come, come up from. So 1972, the astronaut collected the sample regolith from the moon. In this case, the scientists can, can extract the possibility of creating construction materials, powerful oxygen and essential element locally on the moon. So based on the research, we found there are a lot of materials we can use from moon and few of them from earth. So we divide like, like a, the, this kind of a thing. So here are our summarized of materials that we will use the, in our project. So what will be our strategy? So we have selected four case study from our humankind architecture and construction, including the ETFE for inflated membrane referenced from Eden project and Igloo, the traditional building construction that created by ice block and the structure like a dome and 3D printing on inflated structure as ITKE pavilion 2014 and the cementized the module, modules inspired from the Muscarunas Mus Mus architecture. Yeah. And our design will consist of three layers, including outer shell for protecting the, from the space radiation and inner shell for the pressurizing and keeping temperature. And uh, the last one is the underground space for farm production. Each shell also have the, the layers. We also consist of a different substructure and the different fabrication process as well. That we have listed out the, the possibility of using swarm robotics construction in our project. So in terms of construction, material shielding, speed, radiation, pressure, pressure and thermal condition, we just considering this kind of a thing. So here's our concept of a construction process, starting from carving the de de designated land, and then we will get the material from, from the, the regolith that will be used for 3D printing overall. After that, we fill up the gap and attach the, the inflated structure to the base sewer to create inner shell on the inflated structure and outer shell consequently. Here is our story timeline starting from the laying out our seven major and the other minor programs. So first is we cut the rock to create the underground space and the base wall. 
And after that, attach the inflated ETF membrane top of the underground structure, which apply to all modules individually. Then using the robotics, like we're using the Swarm robotics technology, we print a lightweight the structure on top of the membrane and layering more lunar regolith applying to the, the building like a strong covering. And also it, it become like in our eyes, so we, we just constructed the outer shell like independently after all. So here is the our like a overall process from the beginning to end. And now Pan will be like a, explaining about the collaborative workflow. So to think about our design workflow, uh, there are the tools that we have used on this project. First uh, is the Google Sheet, Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit, Speco, and the Rhino Insight that we structureize the different fields of different programs to achieve the convenient works for, for the member. And on, on this slide is showing the whole project workflow that we did for our architectural design, starting from the data that turned into the 2D shape and then developing into the 3D consequently with assigning the data for the project beam. By starting of the project, as we have studied from the research on the sustainable farming on the earth, Alex has created the area sheet containing all the program area required for the proper amount of space to cover food production for 100 astronauts. We link the sheet to Grasshopper with Python to collect the data as well as putting it back when we want to adjust that the data will be used for creating the plan layout with specific size for the specific program area according to the Excel. Then we collaborate with our studio terrain by Speco to locate our project uh, next to the neighbor on the terrain before developing the Grasshopper workflow and transfer the, uh, to Revit using the Rhino inside and Speco. In this chapter, we will explain about our individual working with the, the uh, design tools for computational design Alex will talk about the interior part, Dongya for our inner shell and me for the outer shell. Yes, uh, for the interior, uh, once we agreed that the, uh, our location of the farm with the other, the, the rest of the colonies, we imported the basic geometry into Revit and start using the existing elements and families within Revit to model our, to enrich our interiors and introduce new parameters for these uh, elements to, um, in order to get some basic statistic of uh, our construction, such as uh, wall and floor, and to have a better understanding of what we are going to build. And we'll pa and pass on to Dong Yap to talk about the next element, the interior, uh, the inner shell. So I will talk about the computational design technique to make inner shell structure to dissolve our constraint. So inner shell is based on the inflated structure. Also, our side is not horizontal, but slope. So we need a special form to dissolve this issue. So we use the kangaroo to simulate inflated membrane to generate this special form. So the inner shell geodesic domes are based on hexagonal control for better layout between each modules. Also depends on each individual program, the size and density of tessellations are different. So we use the computation technique for these conditions. Uh, so each program require a minimum value for sun exposure because of, uh, we have to grow the, the plants and the animals. So we use computational technology to calculate the recommended number of windows and uh, generate whole structure. And also there are four specific layers based on our construction technique. So which is the starting from inflated membrane and 3D printed structure and the covering wall. So we used the, another like a computational design technique to generate individual layers all together automatically. And uh, now Pan will explain about the outer shell. For the outer shell, the design focusing on the fabrication paneling block according to the EGU construction that the tessellation panel will be optimized from kangaroo and clusterized by lunchbox machine learning to group the similar panels related to the area, perimeter length, orientations, and deviations. After that, we, it will be averaged into unified shape of paneling types, then placing back into the original position. By creating the unified types, we can use the Revit family panels by creating adaptive model family. 
the using Rhino uh, inside Revit to construct the geometry. In this case, uh, because we have too many panels processing with a small laptop, it takes much time consumption. So we end up just creating four different types of panels according to the number of the corners. The design types including six points, four points, five points, and eight points. Uh, corners, panelings, and assign the layer of materials and detailing into the each family is 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 uh, easier for us in in by doing the, with the Revit. Then the pink is uh, represent the polyethylene that used for the uh, protect for uh, space radiation, and the inner side is the lunacrete. Also, by creating a family as a block, we can easily change and duplicate the variations, such as implementing the opening on the panels. So we choose the specific uh, location that we want to change the panel to have uh, open like uh, by by manually as we as we want according to the the number uh, that Dongyap described. After done all this thing, we would like to present our leaf project finale. So bear with us and let's take a closer look inside. Our space farm, as mentioned, will consist of three layers, including the outer shell the inner shell and the interior, that the circulation of this project have the airlock conceptually show here as in the yellow color, while the second diagram showing the vertical circulation within the model. The connection according to the programs that the admin will uh, be for the resident or the group five that will present uh, tomorrow, the support for the research and the cellular architecture for the wildlife uh, in terms of changing, exchanging stem cell to create the artificial meat. So here is just the render of the atmosphere of the uh, storage module. And here is the view from our base elevation and the section showing the interior uh, and the program as well as the south elevation and somehow showing the kind of like a similar programs. Moreover, we also provide close-up elements for examples like the first left image showing how the inflated attached to the uh, wall layers and so on, the shell structure sections, outer shell panelings, inner shell openings into a 3D printed uh, as well as the 3D printed furniture. To explain about our eco ecosystem for circulation, the project connects uh, tunnels to the colonies uh, at the underground level and link to the lobby space before we exchange the supply uh, uh, both on the directly from the storage or the support zone. For regeneration, the central cent uh, storage, we have the water regeneration on the bottom level that all the water from the building operate will be purified before redistributing into the cycle again. For energy and lighting, as the outer shell and inner shell cladded with a refractive surface that the light can get through and filter by the refraction before entering to the windows. For interior elements, we conceptually try to create our own furniture to know like the number of family we will use in each room to make each food programs. While on the right side showing to demonstrate the farming system and water management will be used uh, of different geometric farming elements. Lastly, we will move uh, to our final part of documentation that I will let Alex explain. Thank you. Yes, we will go back to uh, our interior diagram and take a look, a uh, closer look into each modules. And uh, um, our central modules is the circular, uh, it's a storage modules, which also serve as a, a central circulation space for our farm. and. We have um, four farms modules. They are very similar in the uh, spatial arrangement. Each has a very large um, growth area. And, and we move on to other modules such as the um, um, cellular agriculture lab and the administration modules. They all have uh, their own um, independent access so that they can uh, uh, operate independently in um, in emergency, and this might be at the moment. This is um, this might be an area that is still very diagrammatic. If we're given more time, we would like to work more on how the work, how the farm uh, actually can uh, perform. And we leave you with uh, um, the um, our uh, uh, visualization of the interior of our program and. 
we thank you for your patience, but uh, don't forget to check out our apps to have uh, more information about uh, our our space farm. Thanks a lot for your for your attention. Thank you. Truly outstanding, guys. I can um, show some some of the maybe like uh, to to adjust. In this case, we create the app that we can like uh, to have a turn off and turn on our modular system and also provide a coordinate that can be moved on the, the terrain. So here uh, we can also like um, create the, the interior program. In this case, we use the grasshopper script that we did for our collaborative workflow. So like uh, this is the basically the initial state that we designed of our project. Yeah, thank you. Uh, guys, perhaps you want to, if you want to share this, maybe you want to paste this in the in chat so that the ah, jurors can. Right. It'd be good if you paste the, the yeah. link, yes. Uh, because it's, it's, it's definitely, this also took you a lot of work. It com complements from the other seminar, which are not ni quite nicely tied to this one. And I think that the, the juries will, and the panels will have a lot of uh, fun time to play with your configurator of the LEAF project. Um, <clears throat> I'm honestly impressed because I, I don't know if, if you've managed to, to develop like uh, since since two weeks that we met mm -hmm. uh, another whole part of the project which was was pleasantly unexpected to see in such a level of detail and so uh, thank you thanks a lot guys for all the effort um, I'm just gonna leave more for the for the juries to say I guess I don't know who wants to start. Uh, yeah, so I'll start this time. Uh, yeah, no, very good, uh, very good work. And another aspect of uh, what would be needed to to live uh, permanently on the moon, which is uh, crop cultivation. Uh, yeah, the same remark about the have building part of your habitat underground. Uh, it's a design choice. It has difficulties, so uh, you just need to be aware of that. Uh, I was not uh, completely clear about the... So you have a, a, a layers of uh, polyethylene and lunacrete. How do you attach them together? How do you... Uh, we, we actually, uh, this is just uh, the conceptual, but we plan it to like uh, layer it in, in interlocking. Like, so it, it will somehow like a twist in between when we, when the 3D printing were printed. But um, this, this is uh, that we keep it very conceptual right now. So we, we don't have the detail of that. Okay, understood. Just just think that the, you have polyethylene, which is a very flexible material and lunacrete, which is quite brittle. So you have to think about strategies to bond the two without uh, breaking your lunacrete. And uh, yeah, about the crop cultivation, something you need to think about as well is how you will uh, circulate the water, uh, how you will manage that. Uh, it will be efficient to have a kind of continuous circulation through all your crops. So that's something you could include in your, in your design. That was all from me, very good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can go next. Um, yeah, just mirroring some other points from Advenit as well. Uh, I think this is a quite a key program for the settlement of 100 years. So to see it in the master plan of projects is quite central because uh, the distribution of food, <laughs> uh, of inflows and outflows would be very important. So um, it's interesting to see how you positioned it and also uh, like Advanced said, the circular circularity aspect to this is quite key. Um, you want to minimize any waste. So everything, all the wastes from whether it's like liquid waste or volatile waste from the other programs can feed directly into the farm and be recycled and used again to either as fertilizer or processed or something like that. Um, another good point that you guys have done was um, using the digging or the excavation of material. So, uh, I mean, that's strategically done. I know it's bad, uh, you can't dig underneath, but mm -hmm. by digging halfway and hosting the programs underneath there, you have less shell to build up, which is quite good. 
Um, in terms of the program of the farm, I think one difficult aspect would be temperature regulation, because mm -hmm. that's going to be quite intense um, to create like a stable temperature inside, maybe power intensive, but maybe my point command is a, a bit beyond the scope. Another one is the solar direction. I'm not sure if you guys did angles or studies um, to understand, you know, the predominant solar direction of the that you're getting from the site. So maybe the positioning of your farms, depending on which crop needs it, might be optimized uh, better. So that's one. Um, uh, and the last one is your workflow with uh, the adaptive components and um, clustering. I think that's that's quite good and crucial. We've been experimenting with that ourselves. So um, yeah, to minimize typology, that's quite good. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Thank Jonathan, for for that last bit because I think it takes um, takes someone with experience on this. Um, this pain of, of, of bringing complex <laughs> geometry to, to such documentation to understand actually the the uh, difficulties that this uh, that, that this has to do you know that they have to gone through to the lengths that they have gone through to make this happen so uh, appreciate um, Anna you want to also add up to that mm -hmm. yes thanks to you for the work and I would like to point out the the fact of the different farms. So the, the algae, the agriculture one, the fungi, but then the insects and fish. Um, I haven't seen it in, in previous projects, in previous space projects. And I find it really interesting to see how, how they could grow and how we could get food from that as well. And about the light, as Jonathan said, I was wondering, I saw pretty interesting the, the studio you did about the percentage of light each farm needs. And this way to this way you can know how many windows to have. But I was wondering as well if the orientation of the light was had been considered or not. And I think it's it's a, a key aspect as well to see if the, the windows are enough as you calculated and if the light is going to be direct or not and how many hours and these things. But pretty, pretty interesting. And it's a really good um, project for, for a community on the moon. We need that for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, you wanna address any of this or shall we just uh, go with it? It's, we just continue, no? Now we're banned, aren't you, Alex? Uh, I just want to add uh, congratulations for the the workflow um, and for really bringing this into uh, the final stages of the docu documentation and considering all the all the pieces. So going through the real uh, pains, as David was saying, of bringing this into Revit and considering all the pieces and trying to get as much of the of the advantages of, that Revit can give you. Surely. Um... Um, for the jurors, I think you are getting um, links to the to the plans so that you can see them more in detail. And also, now we've just shared the the link to the app so that you can play around with the configurator that they have built. They have built. Um, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, great work, indeed. Um, and last, so now last but not least, we have um, the, sp uh, the final group, which is. Uh, first of our space residences in the in the moon um, alexandra abed uh, jonathan you want to take it away good hi good evening uh, we are group eight um, Jonathan, Alexandra, and I, Abed, that to design the seasonal biohabitat. It's an experiment of practical concept of growth with time capable of producing via the biospecies at any given moment of growth. Um, 
<clears throat> following from this, um, uh, Selenio Bio Habitat uh, will address uh, some challenging uh, questions uh, related to combination between um, what is economic and what is social and uh, environmental. For example, we, we are addressing question about self-fulfillment, uh, achievement of community, of, uh, of community goals, uh, sustained economic growth, allowing uh, research, allowing uh, development, and it it has also a natural and uh, circular 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 um, uh, ecosystem, resource optimization, and uh, we'll, at the first time we'll be uh, introducing here uh, bio conditions, uh, self sufficient uh, for sustained uh, sustained life and sense of community. And the most important thing is uh, the psychological need for green space. Um, we actually uh, came uh, to conclusion that we should uh, send the, the beginning, send uh, the bacteria to colonize the moon, and um, is searching searching for a technology that can can uh, generate or allow generation of uh, new life on the moon, a uh, life of equal equilibrium and progress. Um, we found uh, some um, interesting and uh, emergent research. Uh, uh, cutting edge uh, research. And I will. Uh, we will highlight. Uh, we will highlight that um, um, the most important uh, three of them for our project. Uh, the first one is uh, how to enhance soil by using bacteria uh, through adding uh, the, the plant parts uh, in order to break down the, big, the bacteria. Then can break down um, uh, these parts into um, in nutrients uh, that could be uh, reaching. Uh, the, the soil. The second one is the, um, a technology that developed already um, about the 3D printing of organi organism um, using a bacteria and uh, those dead uh, plant parts can, can um, um, uh, give us a, a new structure that can be used um, in, in our construction. Uh, the third one is in uh, how to um, uh, in harvest uh, hydrogen uh, from the lunar uh, soil uh, by, a, by, a, by bacteria. Um, and then uh, our, gener I mean, our uh, proposal for generation life on the moon will be starting on uh, at the beginning, um, enhancing the, the lunar uh, soil. Um, and uh, having the nutrients in the soil that allows us to uh, uh, and also, sorry, that allows us uh, to plant uh, uh, vegetation. And uh, at the second point, we will uh, have uh, the harvesting of the hydrogen that can give us uh, some initial uh, water for planting uh, bigger uh, trees or bigger environment, uh, sustain, sustainable env environment in our ecosystem. Uh, we we based on uh, some research that uh, and some, I mean, uh, scientific uh, uh, assumptions that the moss was the responsible. I mean, because of the moss, the, the earth has uh, this amount of, uh, of oxygen. So we will take the moss into uh, our ecosystem that can produce uh, 16 uh, grams uh, oxygen each day uh, for each square meters. Um, and then in, in, in this in, in this amount, we can actually um, calculate that each person for each day, we need uh, 33, uh, 53 square meters of vegetation. Um, the map of the materials that we're going to use, whether they are on the moon or in, uh, from uh, Earth, that they, uh, will be initially uh, brought up, and uh, later they will be produced on on the moon without uh, bringing bringing them back uh, again. Sorry, um, uh, at the second phase uh, and at the second phase, it will be uh, the enhancing soil and uh, planting the moss. Um, and the third the third phase will be um, using the, um, this uh, extraction of materials, um, whether they are um, uh, from um, uh, bacteria mining or somehow um, in, in um, uh, um, uh, process uh, uh, enforced mining. Uh, for the main structure and uh, the bio shield uh, from uh, radiation, which will be ex explained later, and for also the interiors, um, and also we can produce uh, oxygen that uh, um, it can give us um, uh, um, uh, the allowance uh, to uh, plant uh, a, a greenery inside our ecosystem. 
So uh, following from this, we, we looked for an, um, actually a modularity and light structure. And also um, uh, we looked for a scheme that can allow this system to, to generate and uh, um, uh, give, the, give the colony um, a, a growth. Uh, without the, uh, with with um, um, uh, actually um, um, uh, highlighting the need for being to have uh, common areas and the green areas in the in the colony, this is the, our system. Uh, how it's gonna work uh, at the beginning? We struck the structure, and later on we will install uh, the uh, panels, the bacteria panels, and the. Um, and also the uh, solar is lunar uh, so, uh, soil uh, on the top. And in the inner side, we will have the vegetation, in this case, the moss. So in terms of our spatial concept, it's based on the idea of modular growth. So in the project, we are using the following modules. Uh, residential units of sizes radius five meters and seven meters are connected with a common area we call a mother. Mothers have a radius of 10 meters and are connecting with each other using connector module of radius five meters. One of the mothers act as a central hub and connects to the underground station of the lunar system. And so during the design process, we thought about the initial settlement around, of around 100 people as well as the, as well as the possibility of growth. So to accommodate this, we developed a growth algorithm that adds new clusters of mothers and units and allows growth outside of the boundary. So the initial settlement will start from the center hub, including the lunar network system. Uh, then, uh, through the, um, then through connector units, it will connect to another mother that will host another multiple residential units. So in the future, some of the smaller units will become connectors units and will allow access to the new clusters. So uh, the configuration we are seeing now is the initial configuration, and then we'll zoom out to look at the future growth scenario. So for each cluster, the small, uh, two small residential units will be designed as a future connector. And when there is a need to grow in a certain direction, a new mother will be added and new residential units will be populated around it. And this will allow flexibility of the future growth of the colony. So next, speaking about, about the program, here is the diagram of the total floor area of the initial configuration showing uh, each of the discussed modules. And then we'll see the section that shows uh, in the distribution of the program for each of the modules that we presented earlier. And now we'll take a closer look at each of the modules. So um, starting from the grandmother, here is a central hub with the connection to the underground tunnel. And next, uh, the mother will provide the common area joining the residential spaces around it. And that, uh, next uh, is the connector unit that will cover the circulation as well as provide additional common areas. And finally, the residential units. So first, the bigger one accommodating a bigger family, and then the smaller one, a smaller unit that provides a space for a smaller family. In our colony of 100 people, we will need 84 kilograms of oxygen per day. And with the 10,000 square meter interior vegetal skin, we will produce 160 kilograms per day. That means that our project could supply double of the total needed and will bring high psychological benefits to the colony. Regarding the fabrication process, here we can see the step by step. The robots will start first assembling the geodesic structure. Later, we can see how the small units are connected to the mother and how the bacteria honeycomb panels are placed. Here, the honeycomb. Then the dome will be covered with regoliths over the bacteria, and inside, the new soil will be added. Here we can see all the layers of the system. The mother will provide light through a triangular gold coating glass that will be fixed to the uh, geodesic dome. And regarding how we did this project, here we have uh, the, our computational workflow. 
So this is our computational workflow showing the different 11 steps we went through, starting from manipulating the context with our massing in Grasshopper, then developing our growth system with Python, and then transferring out the different layers with Speckle and Reno Insight. In order to give feedback to our system, we analyze it, for example, with Caramba. And finally, Revit was used to receive all the streams and to document the project. In the next slide, uh, we see as well how the, the roles are integrated in this uh, uh, system. So it was really important to create this collaborative workflow uh, where we have two architects and one engineer. Here we can see an example of how the roles are reflected in the different systems of the project. For example, the structure, the bacteria layer, or the walls. And here we're cutting the vertically our project, showing the four layer levels that were created in order to adapt to the specific terrain conditions. We can also see how the bacteria layer is along all the, the project. And in the next one, we will see the first uh, this wall from our project, and it's uh, showing the, the growth aggregation system that uh, we selected. And uh, here is the, the lowest level, and then we go to the level one, and then it's connected to the grandmother. And finally, in the fourth level, it's connected with the last cluster. Here's an overview of our skin and uh, how it was adapted to the topography, one of our elevations. And if we go to the next one, this is an overview as well, one of the, the main parts of the system. And uh, if we go to the next one, here's just like uh, the impressions of our interior atmosphere where we are having these bacteria panels. Here we see the integration of the clusters with this change of topography and how the bacteria vegetation is predominant. Here another visualization of this uh, mother. Oh, well. uh, we can see how uh, it's a social area where uh, it's, uh, yeah, the protagonism is the, the bacteria and the vegetation. Here as well, we can see as well the, how uh, the light is going through the highest part of the, of the dome and how the structure is uh, as well uh, one of the main elements in, in the space. And here we have some images from the exteriors of the project. And this is just a really short overview. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. <clears throat> that was that was truly inspiring. Um, I don't know if you want to leave the spread of the of the of the presentation there for the jurors to see. Uh, from my side, I also want to commend you for for the for the really big effort that you've made in these two weeks. Um, aside from the, I mean, for me, for explaining everything quite clearly. Uh, aside from all of the effort that you have already put before that, so thanks a lot, guys. I'll leave, uh, I, I leave most of the time for the jurors to comment, I guess. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, very good work. Uh, I, I like the, the urban planning aspects of your work, how you design the uh the repeatability of the of the different modules um that that also goes in the direction of making things simple repeatable which is always always good when you are far away from home uh about the um, uh first of all your uh, founding principle for your 
your system is the, this bacteria which extract hydrogen from the from the soil. Uh, so uh, bacteria, we have collaborated with some work on that, are very good at extracting oxygen and materials because the, the lunar soil is, is, is it's pretty much a, a mixture of oxides, so metallic elements uh, bound with oxygen. But for hydrogen, uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of hydrogen in the, in the soil itself. So the hydrogen, typically, you take it from the water, from the ice deposits, or for example. So you take the oxygen from the soil, and then the, you can also take oxygen from the water, of course. But the hydrogen, the source of hydrogen is more the water than, uh, than the soil. But it doesn't change much about your principle, because you can find hydrogen on the surface. Um, you, you are using the bacteria to make panels, if I understand. Uh, the issue that there could be with that is that they are very slow at, uh, at uh, digesting uh, uh, whatever they produce. So uh, you probably have a very slow construction process there. And that's something you have to take into account in your, uh, in your master planning. Um, and also I had a question. So that's a lot of bacteria to make your very big uh, structure. Uh, do these bacteria interact with the crew after that? Are they a hazard for the crew? Sorry, what's the question? So you have, you have all these bacteria, loads of bacteria to build your structure. Yeah. Is it going to be a uh, to the humans after that? Well, um, okay, I will, I will answer this. Uh, first of all, yes, you are right. It's a, um, uh, do you hear me, guys? Uh, I, okay, I yes. can't hear you. I, I have a, pro yeah, okay. We, we're um, muted. It's a, a, it's, it's a slow process. Uh, we are talking about the uh, semi-evolution and uh, it's very important uh, uh, to make uh, the environment sustainable uh, at the beginning on the moon. About the bacteria and the amount of, the, of it, it's, it's, uh, the panels are uh, 3D printed uh, as a, with a form of a honey, honeycomb. So um, they have, um, they have uh, holes inside. So um, my first calculation uh, about this, uh, we are talking about the, uh, 300 uh, uh, cubic uh, um, of bacteria, which will be shipped not in a, in a, I mean in a direct way. They will be shipped along in, uh, the uh, the time, and until um, uh, we have the community uh, all, all already uh, completed. But on the on the inside the ecosystem. They are not uh, in, uh, coming with a touch with the people who are living there, because um, 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 there are uh, a vegetation that um, 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 stand be between them. It's like uh, the bacteria inside the earth, and you will see the flower. I mean, in your garden, it's the same thing. It's the same the same system. Hope hope I I I answered uh, how I yeah. understood your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. So that was all for me. Good work, thank you. Thanks. Okay, I can go next. Um, congratulations for your work. I think this layer with bacteria panels, uh, first of all, the most important thing is that they open a huge a range of possibilities to think out of the box. So not just the common materials we're used to use, but explore any kind of new ideas. Um, I was wondering, this bacteria, I, I guess the, the, the residence is pressurized. So these bacteria are in, inside that pressure. I understand, no? Inside, what? Yeah. They they follow. They are. Yeah, okay. Sorry, the, sorry. I have. 
I have uh, a bad internet, so uh, sometimes I yeah, but it's it it's insight and uh, yeah, it's uh, just assumption. It's right. Okay, so yes, it's a, I think it's a good point to keep investigating and think out of the box to find new materials. And apart from this, I find really interesting as well the pattern the pattern to repeat these got these grandmother and the, the other modules because it can be repeated as uh, as you said but I was wondering as well can you have different grandmothers in case it grows too much you've got different mm, points or grandmothers or or there's just one yeah, actually, this is an uh, in interesting point. I mean, it, uh, it's, uh, the mother is kind of really similar in terms of size to to the to the mother. The only main important thing is kind of it is a hub for connection in terms of uh, the infrastructure in, in in the moon. So uh, it's actually really really interesting to, to try it, like to insert this into the the Python growth because we can set one rule like. Uh, uh, when we reach this amount of, of population, we can uh, again try to settle a new hub and uh, to develop new connections or new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think that one is really interesting, and it's a, a point. Another point to investigate about would be the shortcuts to get from a, a grandmother in, a, in an area of all this network to another one. Should we go through all the mothers or uh, are there any like fast way? So I think that's a, a point to investigate about. It's a really good work. I liked it a lot and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a few points from my end. Um, great work guys. Congrats for the stuff that you've produced. Um, yeah, I, I honestly think the bacteria panel could be a good idea in the future. Um, some concerns is what Ed Bennett was saying around the nutrients available in the soil. And I, I'm pretty sure this pH is really high. So <laughs> it might not work with uh, some species. Um, so that's uh, point number one. The other one is uh, around circularity. So I'm guessing that um, whatever system you guys are implementing if it's producing an X amount of oxygen, all of that oxygen emitted will need to be recaptured again and recirculated within the structure. But there might be even an opportunity to, to extract it and capture it, store it, and then distribute it to the other infrastructure around your buildings um, in the colony. Right? Um, so that could be an interesting point to do. Um, same what Anna was saying is this growth of modules and I see that there's like the mother grandmother that's sort of two or three types of um, domes I guess in a way but we're kind of exploring this ourselves that there will be some sort of threshold where a larger community space is required where maybe you need uh, a different space where people can like a, a big concert hall or something um, so that, that won't necessarily be hit until you reach a certain population threshold. Um, and another one is with this bacteria uh, maintenance, do you need some sort of distribution network for water um, or is the condensation uh, in the air enough to, to... Yeah, I mean, it's touching a lot into this, um, what we call uh, bioregenerative um, ECLS or ECLSS, which is the Environmental Control and Life System Support, which is pretty good. I'm gonna send two links in the chat, and there's some even like a uh, photo bioreactors that you guys might want to decide to look to. Uh, that's one. That's two. Cool, but great job. Thank you. Thank Super you. interesting. I, I, I was wondering and and maybe ask uh, any of you guys if you if you know um, any references regarding bacteria for for the for off world in specific. Uh, if if this is actually 
consider and feasible or or <clears throat> too, too experimental oh we we have looked into bacteria for uh, for material extraction uh, we have a publication in the pipe i can share it when it's uh, published uh, you have to remind me david because uh, i easily forget uh, and then there is another work by a professor in Scotland, I think, who looked into bacteria for the same thing, extracting the oxygen and the raw materials from the regolith. So it's not a, it's not something outlandish. The only thing is you need to understand what you will use them for. But the bio bio processing of the regolith is definitely something which is in the map. Thanks a lot for that. I think that's something also that I, you know, I've been, I don't doubt that I've been keeping in, the, in, my, in the back of my mind throughout this project. Uh, but uh, I think anyway, that even the, the proposal, even in, if somehow speculative, I think it fits within the sense of, uh, of common sense now in a way. Uh, and the, the way that they have developed it, I think it's kind of elegant how it, it matches their the way that they have also formalized the project. So, um, thanks a lot, guys. Um, it's a, it's it's been a really nice presentation, and overall, I think it's been a really uh, interesting evening of uh, set of presentations. Um, I wish I really wish that we would have more time to to go into a deeper conversation for a lot of topics, and especially having. Uh, the jury is here at hand, who can certainly feel a lot of our doubts that we've had uh, throughout the, the studio. And more even so, I also wish that we, we, we could have uh, do the usual thing after the studios and go out and grab a beer and, and celebrate, because I do think that, uh, that the amount of work and effort that you have put for the studio and the, and the results that, that we've seen today this truly deserves a, a cheer of celebration. Uh, so either if it's uh, virtual or not, uh, I I thank you guys for that. Um, who's in who's uh, running this presentation? Maybe you can can you show a full screen of the last slides? Uh, yeah, maybe one of those like number. This one, that one is like fifty nine. Just put, put it on full screen for a sec. Just want to get a nice. Uh, a nice take for the, you know, for the, for the record. Um, also, um, I think you guys can stop sharing now if you want also, because maybe now it's time to maybe show, or turn off or uh, turn, turn on our, our cameras and maybe say goodbye and wrap up this session. Per perfectly on time, may I say, which is a feat already for, for studio sessions. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> I, I think I hope that that our that our jury is also appreciate that. But in in any case, I really really thank uh, both the juries for spending the time with us uh, and the students as well for taking uh, you know all of the uh, time within these weeks to polish your work properly and and not only um, work uh, on the content which you have already had uh, developed so far greatly, but uh, made, making the efforts to make it so easily understandable and, and easily digestible, uh, which has actually uh, led to, to the fact that we can have this uh, type of interesting discussions and conversations addressing the, the, the issues that you want to, to show to the to the jurors. Um, is, I don't know if there's anything else that you guys you want to add before we, we wrap that up. I think it'd be interesting for maybe tomorrow's session because I like the connection between the projects. So maybe have like a ongoing master map to see how this one relates to this one and the other one. I'm not sure if that can be like refresh so we know locally where each project sits. <laughs> it'd be interesting. <laughs> uh, sure. I, I, so one of the things that we've been sort of fantasizing, fantasizing about in the studio is that uh, this colony outlives this this year, and the next uh, colony outpost comes next year, and we just kind of plug into this colony. So maybe in the in the end we can have an MA Beam Studio website where you can see the overview of the projects coming together, and yeah, um, 
in any case, if you are interested, you're all, of course, welcome to join next session either. Uh, juries, if you can find some time to join us tomorrow, it doesn't have to be for the whole session. You can join uh, at any point if you want, or you can just tune in in the Facebook feed and see what the what the projects are about without having to join the the Zoom session. You're you're most you're most welcome to join us. Um, in any case, um, it it's there's a there's a another round of projects coming uh, tomorrow, which uh, which will be definitely also interesting to see. And I really want, just want to thank you guys again for 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 coming and sharing with sharing your thought with us. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to get to know you some, some of you and also uh, having your expertise be important into this into these projects, which certainly have um, in a way a lot of outlook if if the students shall you decide to continue to carry them forward uh, either uh, you know in the BIM area or in the on, in more in the space uh, architecture design area. Um, having said that, I think we can wrap it up on time. Uh, Anna, you want to add to, to my words, maybe? I just want to thank the jury um, again uh, for all your comments and for actually for giving us a lot of insights as well. We will surely use it for the next studio, for next year's studio. Um, and also want to thank all the students for the uh, extreme effort they put in. And also uh, to thank the students who are here from the from tomorrow's group for uh, coming up to support their their um, colleagues. Good. Thank, thanks to thanks to you Anna and uh, David for the invitation and uh, and uh, congratulations to the students. At the end, you are the ones who will design and build the habitats on the moon, not us. So uh, we are just here to help. I would like to say a big thank you too to David and Anna for the invitation and for sure, especially to the students because you did a great work and I was really, really pleased to see them and to try to collaborate as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome, guys. Um, <laughs> so thanks. I don't know if you, you now it's time for you to crash and sleep, or if you go go get you go have a beer. Please have a beer on my name, <laughs> because uh, uh, we will certainly have the opportunity to do this in the future, hopefully. So uh, just wrapping this up. Um, it's been a, a lovely session. Please stay healthy. Anna, Jonathan, Abenit. Thanks a lot again. Really looking forward to seeing you uh, in another occasion. Uh, Oana, thanks a lot for for helping uh, you know, for doing this with me and, and students. Uh, we see each other quite soon. Yeah. Great. It was a great experience. I will turn off the Facebook live right now.